Ontario, California. Okay. <laughs> Very unique. So if you go buy the, all the well, create the well, you could sell water. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Instant business of water. <laughs> The Tuesday, August 19th, 2014 meeting of the Riverbank Planning Commission is now open. May we have a roll call, please? Chair Stewart? Here. Vice Chair Hughes? Commissioner Villepadois? Here. Commissioner Daigley? And Commissioner McKinney? Here. Thank you. But, but let the record show that um, Vice Chair Hughes and Commissioner Daigley uh, are both excused. At this time, any planning commissioner or staff member who has a direct conflict of interest on any scheduled agenda item to be considered are, is asked to declare their conflict. Move to public comments. No action to be taken. At this time, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda and within the subject matter jurisdiction of the Planning Commission Board. Individual comments will be limited to a maximum of five minutes per person. Each person may speak once during this time, and time cannot be yielded to another person. Under state law, matters presented during the public comment period cannot be discussed or acted upon. For record purposes, please state your name and city of residence, and please address the entire Planning Commission Board. Now we'll move to the consent calendar. I'm sorry. That's okay. Chair Stewart, members of the commission as well as staff, um, my name is Jill Anderson. I'm the city manager of the city of Riverbank, and I wanted to take this opportunity to invite all of you to come to the city council meeting this coming Tuesday, August 26th. There will be representatives from the county of Stanislaus to provide an overview of the North County Corridor Project, introduce their website and interactive maps that they are making available for the public. And so I, I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that since this project ha will greatly impact the city of Riverbank. Bank, um, both during construction and once it's ultimately built. Uh, we don't know when that might be, but in the meantime, we are actively involved in the, the planning process. Uh, Mr. Anderson has been uh, very helpful in terms of engaging with the county on a number of issues there, and this is an opportunity for us to make sure the entire council and the community also is aware of this project. So I just wanted to invite you to that. I also want to let you know that with the, um, the workshop on the Dan Hen specific plan, uh, we did not schedule a strategic plan presentation for you, but we'll be doing that in September or October to provide you an update on uh, many of the objectives that we're working on towards our strategic goals. Many of those are related to the downtown specific plan, which you're, of course, actively involved in. But did want to let you know we hadn't forgotten that, and we'll be scheduling that for an upcoming meeting. But I do hope that you can come on Tuesday the 26th to the City Council meeting. That meeting will start at 6 o'clock, and it will be the first agenda item there. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, we'll move yes. to. Oh. Oh, can you come up here, please? So I thought this meeting was discuss this general plan. I want to know how that would affect my property. Oh, yeah, 
And then she said that it's canceled until no, September? No, it's a different, a, a staff report on the city's strategic plan will be considered at a future meeting so we can discuss the item that you're, you're speaking of. Okay, so you will, right it'll be at a, at a later stage. No, you can discuss what you, excuse me, sir, you can discuss what it is you want to talk about now. Well, I just want to know how it is going to affect my property, you know, if any, you know. Well, I mean, we're, are we talking about the downtown specific plan and the notice that, he, that you received? It sounds like it. We're going to be talking about that in a workshop in just a little bit. And at that time, we can find out exactly where his property is and we can talk about specifics. That'd be great. Not the general plan, the downtown specific plan, right? One that affects me okay. is what I'm right. Based on this notice, yes. Right, okay. Any other comments? Okay, now we'll move to the consent calendar. All items listed on the consent calendar are to be acted upon as a single action of the commission unless otherwise requested by an individual commissioner. Um, on tonight's consent calendar, we have posting of the agenda, approval of the agenda, and approval of the minutes. I'd ask for a motion for approval. Yeah, motion that we approve item uh, 2.A, posting of the agenda, and item uh, 2.C, approve the uh, approval of the agenda as well as item uh, 2.C, uh, post, uh, approval of the minutes. Thank you. Dated. Second. And I second. Commissioner Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Villepadois? Yes. Commissioner McKinney? Yes. Thank you. We'll now open our public workshop, item 3.1, the draft downtown specific plan. Mr. Anderson? Yeah, I mean, here's a, this is kind of an open discussion. This is a second workshop that we've had in front of the commission. Again, we're not in a hurry to, to advance this workshop on to, you know, planning commission for official action until we've had the opportunity to talk about any and all items associated with it. Last meeting, we had some specific, um, specific areas that the commission wanted to focus in on. Um, I know there's people in the audience that have received notices that want to talk about certain things. So this is an opportunity for them to equally participate in the process and understand what the downtown specific plan, plan would, would do to their property. Because um, it is a, it is a, a rezone uh, in effect. W once the specific plan gets adopted, it is the implementing strategy for the properties. Um, I can go, I'll go through my PowerPoint presentation um, I'll, I'll hone in on some of the issues that the commission had at the last last meeting, and um, and then after I go through that, then it would be appropriate to open up the floor and then allow folks in the audience to talk about specific concerns that they have or questions or additional research that needs to be done as it might affect their property specifically. So we can talk about that. Let me let me make a couple other comments. Um, for the record, we did send out again 900 notices of this workshop uh, in English and in Spanish as, as instructed um, that we were fortunate to get an article in the Riverbank News uh, talking about this effort. So that was nice. We also published a, a notice outside of the public notices about this workshop. In addition to sending notices to some 83 property owners that um, if the plan moves forward for adoption, the general plan designation on their property would be changed to reflect this new plan. So they obviously need to be, you know, doubly aware of what's going on and, you know, potential impacts this plan would have on them specifically. And, and not only now, really, the bigger issue is what effect it would have on them long term and in the future. So, um, and we're here to talk about that. So from that standpoint, we need to make, make it clear that there's really no time limit. You know, if they want, if there's issues they want to talk about, we need, we're here to, to listen, um, and take notes and, and respond if we can. If we can't respond, then you know, then we'll have to, you know, take down the information and get back to them, which is fine. I mean, there's no problem with that. Um, the notices that we sent out um, referenced, you know, my phone number, our email. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, it's nice to have folks in the audience. Um, 
you know, probably they're here to talk about this, maybe not. I don't think they're here to talk about planning procedures. So this is probably probably a downtown specific plan, which is a good thing. Um, anyway, so I'll, I'll, I'll walk through this. Um, the, whoops, where am I going to point it over here? Oh, yeah. So, okay, so I'm going to go over the plan objectives. Probably what everybody's interested in is the boundaries, you know, what the district zones mean, which are really zoning districts, and what the regulations are, which are the implementing, strat uh, implementing tool for it, and then talking about plan implementation, and then um, at the end of the day, um, you know, plan implementation, then future modifications, because this is a living, breathing document. Um, copies of my PowerPoint are available at the back of the room. Copies of the, the red line version of the draft specific plan that I'm going to be talking about tonight are available on our website and are also available in the back of the room as well. So, I mean, if you guys want to take a look at that, that's cool. We can stop and go over all the specifics. Um, anyway, so, you know, gosh, this is an effort that's been going on for a long time. Um, got, you know, Daryl Daniels and others in the audience. They know that this started back in 07. You know, many, many people in the downtown area think that it's, it's been finished, it's complete, but it really hasn't been. Um, last spring, spring of 13, City Council took action March 25th to certify the EIR for this downtown specific plan, but the plan itself, many aspects of the plan itself, including the boundaries, still needed to be worked out. So that's, so that's what the effort has been, really, to get it into a position where we can talk about it. So that, and that's what we're doing tonight. Um, it does change the, the policies and regulations as it affects downtown investment. The original um, proposal was talking more about RDA, RDA investment, RDA um, opportunities, but we know that Governor Brown took RDA responsibilities away from local government, so we no longer have that as a tool. So really what it comes, becomes more of a policy document, it really becomes more of a policy and implementation tool. It has architectural standards, talks about signage, talks about all of the kinds of things that you would need in order to promote and encourage orderly growth and development in the downtown core area. And again, it you know preserves a lot of the things you know down small town um, character you know identifies the community uh, identity, talks about choice and diversity of of this community, and also talks about improving quality of life, land use, and preserving you know, the existing neighborhoods that we have. Which I know there's a number of people in the audience and in this community that are very concerned with what impact this would have on existing neighborhoods. So our setting, um, obviously, we've got you know a mixed. Uh, mixture of things. We've got you know, SR 108, the Del Rio Theater, which is going to be sold. I mean, the city owns it, but it's actually not owned by the city. It's actually owned by a controlling a agency that's managed by the state of California. It'll be sold. It'll be, it'll be a reuse for it. We have the Cannery site, uh, the former Contadina site that's owned by Sun Ganji. Those folks are very interested in a renewal of that. And you have the downtown core area that received the substantial investment, you know, by the city by the state of California and by others to, to beautify it and to bring it up into position where you have all the infrastructure necessary to support new growth and development. Then of course you've got you know more you know more stuff on the SR 108. You got you know viable businesses. Um, you know thank thank thankfully we have businesses like Snow White Drive In and others that are still viable businesses along this corridor. But we we need we need to help them any way we can. So hopefully this is a tool that'll help them. Um, the original draft boundary, this, is, this was what was studied in the EIR. This is what was um, presented in many of the discussions. It was never a formally adopted by anybody. The plan, when it's, when it's adopted, will establish the boundary. Um, I've looked at this boundary. I have um, discussed the boundary with others. And quite frankly, I think that there, need, there needs to be, some, my suggestion is there needs to be some adjustments to the boundary. So what I've done is I've, as I've made adjustments, I've carved out some of the existing neighborhoods, the existing middle school, the community park, the, um, um, the community center, the, the library, areas that are pretty much already developed and, and not likely to redevelop. And I've included, so what I'm talking about is this area, you know, there would be, it's easterly of 4th Street. And then I've included additional lands in the city limits 
and I don't know if this is showing up on the screens or not, Janet, maybe you can show it with a cursor or something. I've included the lands east. Can you see, can you see a cursor? You got it on a cursor? Can you see it on the screens over there? Oh my God. Okay, great. Okay, well, um, basically the, the properties that are at the east limits of SR 108, you know, as you come into town and try and include those properties in. And then, of course, including the properties that are on the west side of SR 108 on the, on the west side of, of Calendar. Well, did I do that? Where are we at? I'm going to go back. Hang on just a minute. Anyway, to make the plan a little bit more, more cohesive, that's district boundary, so let me go back. There we go. So, so this is a boundary that I think makes more sense than the original boundary. So as I've reduced the size of the area for the most part. I pulled in a few other properties that are along the SR 108 boundary, but I've, I've excluded a lot of the resident, you know, per purely residential areas from the plan area boundary. Because again, in the end of the day, when this specific plan gets adopted, we're going to be rezoning properties. So the way I looked at it, you know, if, if it's unlikely that the properties will be, you know, redesignated to some other use other than residential and they're developed in a residential fashion, why go through the effort of, you know, rezoning their property? And, it, and obviously, you know, both boundaries include, you know, the cannery, which is a, a huge reuse site and includes the downtown core area and all the capital investment the city has made in the, in the street sections and whatnot. And it includes the properties along SR 108, includes the properties north of Patterson Road, and includes um, the other, the other um, properties that are kind of sandwiched in between, including some, re some re uh, existing residential properties. So from here, um, I'm, I'm, I'm illustrating the district, you know, the draft district boundaries is which was the original proposal. And you can think of it as, as zones. Each one of these colors represents a zone like downtown core, um, downtown central, downtown boulevard, et cetera. And then they have a whole list of allowable uses, types of structures that would be allowed, setbacks, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll go through those in a minute. But and I'm even and with these land use strategies, I've made some changes to be consistent with what I'm hearing, and and to be consistent with the boundaries that I think is appropriate for this plan. So here is here is a district boundary. Here is the here is the district boundaries as adjusted, and probably one of the more significant changes is. You know, in, in this area uh, along Topeka, I'm suggesting that this be, you know, simply residential rather than any some kind of a mixed use or high density residential. And the same on the other side of 3rd Street between 3rd and 4th, that it be, you know, residential be con to be consistent with the zoning that it has now and the existing residential units that we have, you know, that are there. And then, of course, you know, Highway, highway Boulevard, you know, picking in, pulling in these properties. And then Highway Boulevard, whoops, my, there, and then the Highway Boulevard here on the western edge. And then, of course, the cannery property. Um, so then, what does that mean? Well, okay, in order to get to these types of uses, you have to have the general plan designation that supports it. So, so it's kind of a building block. So the current general plan designations for some of the properties, there's like 83 properties. You'll see there's a number of them that are designated high density residential. You know, they're kind of in the center core area here. And there's a number of properties that are designated medium density residential. And a number of properties that are designated mixed use that I'm thinking as a result of this land plan and what's there existing should change to something like this. So mixed use up along the highway, mixed use including, you know, the Catholic Church, the dental office, and um, other properties along uh, Calendar, and then mixed use for the properties up adjacent to 3rd Street and Patterson, 
and then back to a medium density residential for properties for the most part that are zoned R2, which would be consistent with the R2 zoning that they currently have. So um, obviously if we don't do the specific plan or and or we come up with cha you know, some other type of mix of these district boundaries that I've suggested, then that will be ref that'll have to be reflected in new general plan designations here. One follows the other. I mean, it's kind of a building block, right? The general plan sets policy of density and use. The zoning and or specific plan tells you what you can do on the property and all the other specifics. So um, everybody's got their own desires of what they'd want to be able to do with the property. And I've tried to be as consistent as I can with the property's existing zoning because it's real difficult to explain to somebody that Whose, whose current zoning is commercial, why you're changing them to multifamily. You know, it's, it's, it's zone, been zoned commercially, it's being developed commercially, why are you changing me to multifamily, right? So the idea is to try, try to keep it consistent. And that's, and that's what this is all about. There's gonna be discussions and questions about these maps. I'm going through those now. I don't know if, I don't know if chair, chairperson, if you wanna, want me to pause now and maybe there's people in the audience who want to talk about these maps before I go any further. Maybe that's the right thing. Because this is a workshop. Because I have a question for okay, myself. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, if, what is it going to take to just decide that we're going to uh, go with your suggestions rather than the, than the original drawing? I mean, what, what needs to be our first step so that we can stop flipping back and forth? Because that's really confusing. I mean, what does it take to, to decide this is probably the best idea for the city, and then we can follow up on all the problems that are going to. I, I, I think I think a consensus of the commission helps me, and then from there I just move forward with what I believe the consensus is. But it's also important to afford you know those those property owners that would be affected by these decisions to have the ability to talk about it, because maybe they have concerns about it that we haven't heard. So let's. So let's hear about, I mean, that's, again, why we haven't been in a hurry to do this, right? This is our, you know, second workshop that we've had, you know, in 2014, but they've had other workshops before this that have led to those older maps. So, so I, ha I have to show history. It's important so everyone understands what's going on and what direction we're going and why we're making the changes that we're suggesting that we're making. But to answer your question, by consensus, I think is fine. I think, I think that's fine. That, that helps me. Because in the end of the day, I've got a red line version of the plan up on the website. I'd like to replace that with what the plan that I think we're at. So everyone in the public has a chance to take a look at it, understand it, ask questions about it before we take formal action to approve. Right. I, I think it's really important to get a, a, a starting point that yep. everybody is aware of. Yep. Okay, and this is a workshop, so anybody that has any questions or comments, please feel free. It's our city. We need to work together. Anybody? My, um, <clears throat> uh, hello, my name is Daryl Daniel, 3442 Atchison Street, Riverbank. And uh, uh, the, on my zoning on, let's say, my Snow White, 5th Street, okay, uh, it is, depending on which decade you look at, it's zoned all different things. It's zoned, it can be zoned C2, C3, whatever. Uh, you can even build a hotel there, I guess, at C3, huh? So, uh, uh, my, the residence that's beside me is also residents, and they're, uh, most of those are C1s. I, as, uh, at least when I used to own one of the houses before. And I couldn't do much with it because it was zoned. So every, and just like in, even in my own place, and just like Servo's, Servo Liquors is going to be, in the future, is going to be wondering what zone it is because his insurance is going to want to know this and this and that. But even for myself, is uh, if you start changing all these, you know, if I'm residential, then my insurance wants to know this. And they're going to say, well, then I don't get this. You know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm zoned commercial. I'm supposed to be commercial. So that's the same thing when you're doing like that. When you're changing all these different zones, and I understand you've got to be uniform, but when you're talking about 
crossroads, it needs to be uniform, of course. You can't just have a bunch of, you know, miscellaneous stuff. You know, you got to have a full uniform. But downtown, you know, when you build something from 100 years ago and you kind of progress every decades and things change, you know, uh, and eventually your landlords pass away after so many decades down the road, of course. So, um, um, so anyway, with this whole thing is that, uh, and I wasn't really even going to be talking about the, uh, even my driving because it's pretty much, as far as I know, it's set and stuff like that. I'm also wanting to making sure that my area is uh, is not Ghettoville because, of course, I'm always trying to get uh, loans at my place, and they take pictures around that area, and of course, all they see is a bunch of uh, boarded up. Uh, nothing buildings or something around my area that looks like, you know, um, you know, I don't know, uh, Kettleville. Uh, and it's trying to get a little bit better, of course, in some areas. The other is what you do can be a big impact of what you do between Del Rio and Servo Lakers. That's two major, uh, two major areas like that, and one won't do until the others. You know, I wouldn't spend a lot of money on Serval if I don't know what Del Rio is going to do. I'm not going to spend any money on Del Rio if I don't know what Serval is going to do, or that whole lot. Uh, same with the cannery. The cannery doesn't, well, why would I build a nice, great, wonderful hotel there if I don't know what the highway is going to do? So uh, if nobody knows, you know, what they're going to, is it going to be business highway, or is it going to be what highway, you know? Is it gonna, still going to have the traffic, even if it's not uh, Caltrans? Um, uh, but uh, I already know a lot of my truck drivers says, you know, it's going to be truck route anyway, no matter what. So, uh, because Escalon people still has to get through Riverbank, um, you know, Escalon people, I guess you call it, or that area, let's call it the other side of the river, to uh, there to get to where they need to go, which is passing by Snow White, of course. So, uh, uh, so you've got to keep the traffic flowing, of course, and like that. But what you do with the cannery is so much, you know. You need to work with the people that's on the side. If it's the church, you know, if they have some primary, I was even just talking to him about, if he's got some main parking lot, you got to push and shove and give him some more parking lot in another area, close by him, but maybe in a different area that's maybe not in the uh, a prime highway area. You know, maybe behind, you know, underneath something or under whatever you want to do. I mean, there's ways of doing things. Um, so, um, and that's the same as what you're going to do with all the the thing. You gotta you gotta have a plan. You also have to have a plan for when and where is going to be the future hotel. You got to. You can't be a town 50 years from now that's not going to have any hotel. And uh, it's just, it just would be, you know, at least we'd be on the market, at least we would be the only city in California or somewhere that would not have a hotel that's so big, I guess. Uh, I, that would be a market. <laughs> but, um, uh, but that's, I get people constantly, they come to my drive and they think that I'm the, the tourist map area of the, of the city, I guess. And they ask me, where's the nearest hotel? You know, and I have to tell them, you know, go to Hotel, go to Esclon, go to somewhere else, you know. But Riverbank is basically, after 10 o'clock, you better go home or get out of town. It's really is what it is. You can't have coffee at 3 o'clock in the morning. Where are you going to go? All right? So you can't, you can't stay overnight in Riverbank, and you can't have coffee at 3 o'clock in the morning or whatever, like Denny's or whatever you want to call it. Um, so it's basically, you know, after 10 o'clock, it's close up and you know the good news that's why I probably stay up until 9 or 10 you know myself so anyway that's just different things on mine so thank I'll you, thank you. you know, actually raised some some good issues yeah. um, a, b a bunch of issues and I want to go through through them one at a time um, first you know this is a vision all right w just because a city develops and adopts a vision doesn't mean it happens, you know, the vision becomes reality overnight. Um, and it takes time. Um, this, this plan does not force any of the property owners to adhere to the standards right away. If they need to do repairs or whatever they're building, 
you know, there are certain provisions to allow them to continue to, to conduct the use to keep the building the way it is over time. However, if they make major modifications, reinvestment in that site for that use or another use, then that's when they have to start adhering to the plan. So that's, that's, an, that's an important aspect. The other is, because we are talking about zoning, we are affecting the use, which ultimately affects appraised valuation. So we have to be real careful how we deal with that, because we don't want to adversely affect, you know, Daryl and, and, and or any other business or property owner adversely. So, it, so they can't do the types of things they want to do with refinancing. So it's a real tight line we're, we're, we're following there. In Daryl's case, his property, at least the properties along SR 108, you know, are envisioned to be commercial and residential, to have a combination of the two, kind of what we have now. So that's, that's consistent with what he, what he was talking about. Um, you know, SR 108 is, is at the location it is now. There's a lot of talk about this thing called North County Corridor. Um, we know that Caltrans has shifted the funds for the Oakdale Bypass to this thing called North County Corridor. How long those funds became available, we don't know. You talk to the county, they'll say they're committed to the North County Corridor project. The county is moving forward with a couple different alternatives. They, they are enthusiastic that they'll be able to start construction on that project, you know, by 2020, you know, which, you know, six years. Okay, I'm not sure that's going to happen. It, maybe it is. I don't think they have all the funding identified to make it happen. When and if they do make it happen, then that's when we deal with a reallocation of what SR 108 consists of. But I think you're still going to have the type of traffic flow, certainly relative to truck, truck trips, on that corridor. And, that, and this plan takes care of that, or really talks about it. It sets goals and policies. That's what it does. Um, anyway, that was, that was it. That was it. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Comments? Questions? Please come up. Was you got the railroad. Why don't we running. go ahead and introduce yourself oh, first? John Van Buren. I'm happy with the zoning. It's been mixed plan, yeah, and you're going to keep it that way. And so that, I have no. That's what I. That's fine with me. I even might even donate my property and make it a you know riverbank park. You know when I die, and give it to you. you know, as long as it remains a park for the citizens of Riverbank. I, you know, it's a 200 feet by 200 feet at the end of the road. But you have the railroad going right through the, midi the middle of the city. And sometimes it's like, every, especially on the Santa Fe, every 15 minutes, you know, you, you've got the railroad going through. Then you also got that, um, I don't know if you have a, you know, for the, I'm a first responder at AMT, and you also have a problem, you know, they space the oil cars now among, you know, these, these trains are, you know, really, really long. They got an engine in front, and they got an engine in back. And now instead of, you know, having 20 oil cars, they have maybe 10 here at the front of the train, 10, you know, at the back of the train. And so that could be a problem, too. But also there's a spur to Oakdale that runs right by my house. And as Oakdale gets, I think it's the only railroad spur to Oakdale. And as Oakdale gets larger, I've noticed an increased amount of traffic. I've, I've always had a problem with, because you got, I have, I talk to the engineers because sometimes they wait, you know, at the end of Third Street, I got them to back up because my neighbor, he's not here today, they park right next to his house with the engine running. And so when he's sitting in his living room, you know, it's wow. vibrating his house. But I got him to park back 100 feet by talking to the engineers. At least they complied that. And then I've talked to him about, you know, at 3, 3 a.m. in the morning, it's a state law that they have to blow the horn. Okay, but they don't have to lay on it for a minute or two, you know. Because I don't care what anybody says. You don't get, I don't get used to it. And this is my grandmother's house that, you know, so I was, you know, 
been connected with this town since I was, you know, a baby. I was raised in Stockton, and I moved here in the 80s when my grandmother died. I'm in a conservatorship fight with my brother. That's why it says it's under conservatorship, because my brother put my mother in a rest home in Stockton, and I wanted to take care of her, and I'm in a conservatorship fight, and that costs a lot of money. That all ends up is that the lawyers get it. But I'm wondering, you know, you, you said Ganji still owns the cannery? Because I thought the corporation Morningstar you know, was that because I worked, <coughs> I'd worked on and off at the camp. Yeah, as far as far as I know, it's still Sun Ganji. And in, in fact, um, on Friday, we're meeting with the Sun Ganji folks to talk about their concerns with the downtown specific plan specifically. So, you know, this process is a reiterative process. We, we, you know, we continue to have discussions about you know concerns that are expressed and you know adjustments we can make to the plan to try to accommodate everyone's goals and objectives. You know. Um, the comments that Mr. Van Buren are bringing up are an integral part to whatever we end up with in the end of the day on this plan. One is that we have we have tr we have we have train trip traffic on the BNSF main line, and the train traffic is due to increase. And in fact, I think we're already starting to experience that now. Right. And and I've heard some folks at BNSF and maybe not just in the Central Valley, but in other areas in the nation talking about double tracking. So it not, it's not inconceivable that we can end up with a double mainline track coming through well, Riverbank. So it will this proposed underpass or overpass? We, let, me talk about, let me talk about that in a minute. The, the, other, the, other, issue, the other issue is that as we know, because we were involved in a bit of a litigation issue with Tuolumne County, is that Tuolumne County now has an open pit mine that they are going to be mining rock, rock product, rock aggregate product, that they will be using the Oakdale line, you know, to haul that product to the BNSF main line. So you've, <laughs> so you've got more traffic coming on the BNSF, and then you've got the Oakdale rail line that's going to be, it's used now, but it's going to have more use as associated with the aggregate products. Which leads into this whole issue, which is really a policy issue, regarding Santa Fe. And what do we do with Santa Fe? Because the plan calls for Santa Fe to pass under the BNSF main line. And that is an integral part of the downtown specific plan. Um, so, and it's, and it's a very costly, I mean, you know, back in 06 when it was first talked about, they were saying like four and a half million. City of Merced just finished a similar type project and it's closer to eight. So we're using an eight million dollar figure based on what Merced's gone through. And um, we're going to be, you know, the suggestion is if the policy is set that that's what we need to do, that we'll be uh, spreading that cost to all new development through the system development fees that the city has adopted. So you feel that um, it's important enough to the citizens so that should go to the top of the list? Well, I mean, that, again, that's a, that's, a, that's a policy decision that the city council and the mayor are going to end up having to make. You know, number one, is it, nece is it necessary to support, you know, downtown? Um, you know, I think, I think the concept, I mean, the concept was, was right, and that is to promote and encourage retail development in the downtown core area, you need to have the linkage. You know, we got the viaduct, great. Patterson Road is a mess at, at the railroad. We're going to do some work to try to clean it up. The railroad's going to try to work with this, but it's going to be mostly on our dime, which means it's going to be extremely expensive. And there's some switch gear in there, some of which is electronic. It's very expensive to relocate that stuff. So anything we do at the Patterson Railroad crossing is going to be, you know, time-consuming, expensive, et cetera. So should we be looking at another alternative? And, and is the Santa Fe the right thing to do? Is it right for the city to anticipate spending $8 million in an underpass there for vehicles and pedestrian? Or should we be thinking about just a pedestrian overpass? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. In the end of the day, it's got to be a decision the council is going to make to support that, because that's the vision and goal, right? That's what we're going to do long term. So yeah, go right in. In Escalon, next to the Bank of the West, they have speakers. Yep. On, is 
there any way to get speakers put on Patterson? That's another. That's another. Um, another very good point. Um, in Escalon, they did a thing called wayside horns. There's actually two different techniques that we can we can employ with the railroad to help reduce train whistle noise. Train oh, whistle sure. noise. What Escalon did is it's an electronic. It's an electronic noise that's created at and it's direct. It's a directional horn at the intersection itself. So what happens is the r the train conductor comes through town electronically deploys that's that horn at that at that crossing so he doesn't sound his horn on his on his engine so that's one mechanism the other mechanism is what Stockton just did and that's called a quiet zone crossing and they did that on Murata they did that on Murata between Highway 99 and West Lane and that's and that's a quiet zone crossing um, requires special medians and special um, lights and special c crossing arms so the traffic can't go in the opposite direction and go around the arms. Um, it's very costly, very expensive, and in both cases the obligation and liability associated with that work goes back to the city. So BNSF in that case, and in this case, BNSF washes their hands of any liability. The city of Escalon assumes the liability, and the city of Stockton assumes the liability indefinitely. So it's a very, it's a big, very big pig, uh, very big pill to swallow for a local jurisdiction to assume that type of unlimited liability to do that kind of thing. But certainly is possible, certainly is possible. And in fact, in the environmental document on the downtown specific plan, it talked about that. It said that you could do this, but you know it wouldn't completely mitigate the impacts associated with a rail railroad. And in fact, the council adopted statement of override considerations in that regard. So. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Any more comments, questions? I'm not sure if it's a comment or not. I'm uh, Joe Catedra. I have a house on Topeka and Fifth Street. And the house is 100 years old. And on plan A, it looks like you were going down to Topeka and plan B doesn't look like you're doing it and if you were to do A what would it consist of? Okay or so um, uh, so very good question um, let me try to get back to um, the map as presented the, the boundaries as presented would be these boundaries and the map would be this so if we're talking if my on the on this I draft got, here we're in it so 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 this is um we're at the peak right, right, right here behind right right here. Right in here correct right in here somewhere i guess right in here so it would be uh downtown neighborhood is what it district it was suggested so downtown neighborhood talks about there and is a home preserve enhanced residential character while encouraging new resident development. So that's that's what it would be. But it wouldn't. What do you zone now? Do you know? I have no idea. Yeah, it's probably res it's probably a residential residential zone. So it would it would be it would be consistent. And we'll look at something else. Downtown neighborhood uh, up to where's the. I want to look at stories, two stories. So, it was that same. One. It'd be the same. It'd be the same. It'd be two stories, two stories. Now, now, what's the what's in? What do you consider two story? Thirty-five feet, up to thirty-five feet. We only have a one-story house. Understood. Okay. Understood. What What's important that hasn't been done, that's that still and, and, it, and it's been talked about, it still would be important to do, and that is to create. You know, historic preservation. I don't want to say historic preservation district, but at least create historic preservation or historic. What do I want to say? Create a list of historic places in town. You know, and at least have that acknowledgement because th this uh, sounds like yeah, it's, one of the, it's we obviously have one of the one few of them. older homes that are still hundred years. Right. Yes, and it's in really good condition. Right. Right. So, in other words, in an effort to protect and preserve what we've got there. But in, in Plan the B, we yeah. would not be part of that. No. But in Plan A, what would you do? Well, I mean, we're not. Again, it doesn't do anything because it does, nothing happens. It's a vision. It, nothing happens unless 
Um, but once the vision moves forward 10, 15, 20 years from now, what would happen? Only if you do something with your property. Like what? Sell it? Sell it. Or sell it. Well, not worry about it. The sales transaction doesn't trigger a change. Okay. The change would be triggered by what you would want to do with the property. So let's say you'd want to all of a sudden tear the house down okay, and do well, something that, different. That, that's not going to happen. Right, okay. okay. So there you go. So nothing's going to happen. So nothing's going to happen. Correct. I mean, okay. In or out doesn't matter. So it's not like you're is. widening the streets nope. and coming. Okay. Nope. Cool. Nope. Uh, thank you. Nope. Thank you. Hi, my name is Norma Arauza, and my question is very similar to his question. I also have properties on Topeka and um, I'm not even sure what the street is, right behind the mortuary, or in front of the street. Okay, so she's, she, she's in the plan, in both plans. Right, but our, ours is actually... So, second street, you on second and... Stanislaus? Topeka? Topeka. You're on Topeka. Topeka, and it backs up right into the mortuary. Right there. So, right, that's Santa Fe. Right there. She's right there? Above. Okay. Right above, it's right here. You're in the neighborhood. It's a fourplex, and our plans are to tear down eventually and rebuild. So what does that affect us? How does that affect us? Sounds like you'd still be in the neighborhood. Um, well, I mean, again, plan I... Plan A. It, it, you know, uh, under Plan A... It's different. Um, well, no, it's here. It's still, it's still here. It's still, it's still neighborhood. Re it's still neighborhood residential. So it wouldn't affect us a bit. The, 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 the change, story? the change really is. Let me go back. The change really is that um, right now. Medium, right? Yeah. Well, you're probably. I think you're zoned R two. Most of those properties in there are zoned R two. The current general plan designation. I don't know why they did this, but it's designated as high density residential, which is inconsistent with that R2 zone. And what I'm suggesting is to go back to a medium density residential. So they're, they're uh, what does that say? Proposed? That would be the proposed. So it'd be medium, so nothing. You'd be allowed nothing. allowed to well, you'd be allowed to do your duplexes. In the very west east side, is it in Eighth Street? I mean, I can barely see the writing. Is it Eighth Street where it ends? Uh, no, fourth. we're we're proposing to end. It'll be Fourth Street. Fourth Street? No, yes. no. Um, the previous the right. on the previous slide was uh -huh. uh, draft one. Is that? Hang on. Fourth, fifth, sixth, right seventh, Hattison. eighth, eighth. Correct. It's it's eighth eighth Street. Street. Okay. And why are these little pages here? It says Tina and. That's on the south side of Patterson Road. Right. Um. So what? How does that affect us? That area right there. South side of Patterson? Uh huh. Doesn't affect anything on the south side of Patterson. It doesn't? No. Okay. No. Uh, it, um, no. It, Patterson Road itself, we're working on a couple different diagrams, goals to clean up Patterson Road so that we get the lanes of traffic that we need, that we get a class one bike path, hopefully on the north side of Patterson Road, and a safe sidewalk on the south side all the way between Roselle and Claus, which right now we don't have. Okay, well I have property right off of Highway 108 also. Okay. Is that going to affect us at all? I mean, I don't where, see it in the map. Where, whereabouts on 108? Is right it in the city or in the county? County. Okay, it won't, doesn't affect you. Okay, great. All right, thank you. It does not affect you. Thank you. Thank you. the alleys. What I've noticed over the years, <coughs> see, I live, I, I live next door to a jewelry store now, but at my own expense, I, I've lit up the alleys, and then I have posted, you know, security cameras, you know, present, which I have, you know, cameras out there, and I, what I've noticed, uh, it really stopped a lot of traffic going through, because I see, like, the, uh, kids going over to uh, Cardoza school at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning smoking a bowl of marijuana, you know, going down the alley before class. And um, so I thought if I put cameras out there, then I could, you know, stop it. And they, what I found out now is that most of the criminals at night or stuff, they avoid my alley because, I, because it's lit up. 
the uh, jewelry store owner, he, I don't know what his problem is because I've talked to the guy a million times and it's dark around the jewelry store and so I have to provide the lighting, you know, in the alley there to light it up to keep guys, you know, I've seen people, you know, casing the jewelry store that don't belong there. But as long as I, you know, I'm kind of like the neighborhood watch for just around my neighborhood anyway. There's a feral cat colony that I feed every day over on 4th Street that there's a an apartment complex over there that they don't, they're, they have no responsibility for their animals and stuff and they, you know, let like male chihuahuas run the streets and uh, I fix the feral cats because I have a, with a pet alliance, it's with the Oakdale shelter so I can, I can catch them, I can spay them and then I release them and then, you know, little by little it's, I've done that at 4th Street and then at the dollar store. The dollar store, where the cats were going, you know, kittens were being born, and so I'd catch them, and then I'd have them spayed, and then release them, and then it, you know, I'm still doing it. You know, if I see, you know, feral cats, I'll try to trap them, fix them, and, you know, release them. You know, it's, it's a lot of problems. But these alleys, uh, that, you know, run up and down Riverbank are just like pitch black at night. Yeah. And I just see the, this neighborhood since the, uh, the first plan of redeveloping downtown, it's kind of like the neighborhood has gone up where most of the crime I've seen since the building out in the suburbs, that's where all the crime is now, you know, and I also got, you know, got the fire department right there, and they, uh, I tried to get them to change their route from going down 3rd Street, and so if you have a busy day, and not only am I dealing with the railroad, and, you know, and then the fire engines, you know, are going down 3rd to get over there, and that State Street or that area seems to be getting worse. There's more murders or, you know, where the... Uh, you know, this, the, the streets named after states off of, what is it, Terminal over there? That area seems to be going, uh, I don't know, murders now in uh, Riverbank. But I'm, I'm just really kind of concerned about with the alleys. Is there anything to privatize the alleys? You know, can we, can land owner, you know, so we can... Well, I mean, you know, typically the alleys have been, they, they have in them utilities, water and sewer. And, um, you know, this is part of the historical town site that was laid out, and those are dedicated to the city. So, you know, they're dedicated to the city and most part maintained by the city. It's unfortunate that, um, you know, the city's resources are thin, so we do what we can with the, with the resources that we have to physically go in there and maintain them. I do know that if we have property owners that are relying on alley for either primary or secondary access, we make sure that they're responsible for, you know, improving the alleyway, you know. And I know in a couple cases we, we've done that, we will continue to do that, but um, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Sorry. Well, I just wonder, are you going to, any plans to ever light them up? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, then uh, I'll just take care of my own part of town then. Okay. Excuse me. But that is a good point to attend some of our um, some of our, our hearings we have with the mayor and the um, council to bring up those issues, of, you know, so that they can look into it a little bit further and possibly give you a, a better answer than what you can get here. Oh, well, you know what? Do you attend those meetings? Well, at the beginning of our uh, of my conservatorship fight with my brother, um, see, when they first started, started the development plan, they said they were going to put a sidewalk in my house. Okay, as part of the deal that my brother and my mother made, we were going to build on another room and bathroom for my mother. Well, we got held up in that because the city said they were, they were going to put a sidewalk in front of my house. Okay, then they ran out of money. Okay, but then if I was going to build an addition with that room and bathroom, they wanted me to put in 
a sidewalk. And so I talked to one of the old mayors, the other O'Brien, and he said he, you know, he could have passed it, and uh, I can't think of the, it's not a variance, but that I, you know, I could have gone ahead and, and built without worrying about the sidewalk. And, but it, what it ended up, we finally got it solved between, you know, if I put pavers in, because well, if the city's going to end up putting a sidewalk in there anyway, they're going to rip out whatever sidewalk I put in. But at least if I had a paver sidewalk, then I'd be at least be able to recover the pavers, you know, if the city put it in. But meanwhile, because it took so long, I got served with conservatorship, and I had to go to court. I didn't have a lawyer. My um, brother had a lawyer. He got temporary conservatorship, sent the knife right in my back, and $10,000, well, actually $20,000 later, I'm still playing catch-up trying to get my mother out. And the, the woman mayor, that uh, she ended up passing the buck, and all that uh, did was uh, take time, and so she's no longer the mayor because I, I'm retired. I'm a stable veteran, retired. And I had plenty of time, and so I just went out and campaigned against her, and she's no longer the mayor. And I, so I got, you know, felt a little better about that because she was more concerned with her broken leg than taking care of her citizens. But anyways, I just wanted to comment about the, the alleys. So I'll just take care Point of so. my Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Larry King, uh, I live in Riverbank. Just a quick question on page six. It's got draft district boundaries, boundaries, and on page five it has draft district boundaries. Are these this? Are they the same picture? Is there? It, you just, I'm just didn't. One's a probably an aerial. Is that this one? No, oh, like right here, draft district boundaries here. That's that's uh, this one. Uh -huh. And then on the next one, is, is that's this? that is a reduced boundary. That's suggested by staff. That's what that is. All I've done is, all I've done is I've taken what is a larger boundary, and I've and I've added some acreage and reduced it to this this configuration. That's the suggested. That's the suggested boundary. boundary correct. Um. I live on Topeka, F1 Halbert. I live on Topeka by First Street. Um, my house is almost 75 years old, and there's houses on that block that are even older than that. My, when you redid this plan and you chopped it off there at Fourth Street, is it, and left all the rest of the existing residential out, you left us in that little strip of Topeka. That little strip of Topeka is straight residential. There is no commercial in it other than where it crosses 3rd Street. It's straight residential. And I would like to know why we're not being included with the rest of the residential. This is the, the right below the blue right there on Topeka. The, the, the issue that Evelyn has at this point is that um, I think she's appreciative of the fact that I've carved out you know, predominantly residential area that will never ever, you know, change, you know, and what we what you see is what you get. And her her property, at least Topeka, and not just her property specifically, but that Topeka the area of Topeka between fourth and beyond first is in the plan. And um, so I think if you were to ask her, she would she would like not to be in the specific plan. But the reality is you know, I've got to draw. I got to draw a boundary around the planning area, and because of her proximity between the downtown core area and the cannery site, you know, she's kind of in between. So it's difficult just to exclude, you know, her property and/or the properties along Topeka from the plan because it just would be kind of the property would kind of inconsistent. But that that's that's. I mean, I'm, I clearly understand where she's coming from. She wants out of the plan. The, the property between fourth and fifth is just as close or not closer to the core than I am. So it's kind of like pick and choose what you want. You said that um, the reason you took the rest of the neighborhood out was because it was unlikely to be rezoned for other uses. So you're saying 
Topeka is likely to be rezoned for other uses. No, I'm not. I'm saying that there, the, this, the, the center of the plan area is really around 3rd and Santa Fe, <coughs> you know, going to the east, you know, okay to, okay to you know, 4th Street, certainly along SR 108, but then the other focus is on the other side of the BNSF main line, you know, including, including the cannery property and some of the, you know, uh, you know, the empty underdeveloped properties along, you know, SR 108 on, on the west side. And, and Topeka is kind of, sw is in the middle. It's, it's kind of swept in. Your, your definition for your residential includes apartments, flats, townhouses located in upper stories of commercial block buildings. It includes live work of all different kinds of things that can be put in there. And a straight residential. Now, on Santa Fe behind us, we got the mortuary, the, the Masonic Hall, the church in there. They're limited to two stories. We're supposed to be limited to two stories. 108 is going to be four stories or six, whatever it is. Okay, you've got all this commercial on 108. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Just one second. You've got all this okay. commercial on Santa Fe. Can I finish, please? Okay. Okay, on Santa Fe. Well, I just wanted to make sure they knew that the current zoning along 108 is most of it C2 or, or commercial industrial. C2 and commercial industrial allow six-story buildings, okay? So that, and that's what she's referring to. Our plan only allows four-story. In, real, in reality, it's, it's likely that it'll be two-story, which is pretty consistent with what we've got now. I'm sorry, Evelyn. Go okay, ahead. My question is, since you've got commercial and industrial on Santa Fe behind us, and you've got all this commercial up on 108, and now you're going to put us in this with the, all this live work and all this business stuff, where are the residents supposed to park? I got a good answer to that question. Where no, no, no. I mean, I mean, parking is is obviously an issue. Um, you know, the residents have an obligation to provide parking on site. Most of those do have on site parking, and on Topeka and some of the larger streets where you got a hundred foot of right of way, you have diagonal parking. So there actually is more than ample parking on a lot of these streets. I think the bigger issue is that if you have you know, a bunch of commercial development in the downtown core area, which we'd really like to have, it right? Builds out more. Yeah, then then it's it's possible that we could have a parking issue, but the reality is that we're going to have to go through and do a parking parking supply analysis to determine exactly what what we need and what has to happen. But we need to have demand. Right now, we don't have much in the way of parking demand. I mean, it's un I mean I, I'm sorry for that. I wish we had more commercial development downtown, but it is what it but is. At the previous meeting, we discussed having like those little parking by permit Passes signs, and, and really, if it ever reached that, we could always do it after the fact. But we have a certain aesthetics. You're, you guys are really big on aesthetics on some of these other things you've done. The downtown has its own aesthetics because it has the older buildings, the older houses. It's the history. This stuff will change all that, and it won't change it for the good. Now you're talking about this underpass, and yeah, the trains are getting worse because they even switch up on the uh, north side of Patterson now, and they have that highly volatile oil and stuff. If you, I looked at the, the general, the specific plan, and they, the study they did for the underpass, and when it comes through on the Santa Fe, it takes out the skate park, or do you take out somebody's home? And what happens to traffic on First Street? According to the EIR Pacific plan, you're going to widen the first street. What happens to the homes on that when you widen that street? Because that's what it's calling for. The the underpass, the Santa Fe underpass, does take up considerable amount of right of way, which, quite frankly, some Ganji is very concerned with, because if we set aside the right of way that's necessary to build an underpass, they can't build on it, and. And I, I, I can't tell you right now how wide that would be, but I can't imagine it's going to be more than 100 foot of width. Right. Um, it, it will affect the skate park, not all of it, but the northern portion of the skate park, at least, you know, the, um, the picnic area and some of the sidewalk will be affected by it. And obviously the property to the north of that would be affected by it too, when and if um, the underpass is built. But it's an, it's an eight, $8 million price tag, and that's in today's, Today's cost. 
you know, by the time you physically have the, the dollars to do it, you know, it, it may be escalated to 12 to 15 million. Who knows? So it's not happening tomorrow. It's definitely not happening tomorrow. I would still like f for you to comment or to give a reason either tonight or whenever as to why you can't take us out along with the rest of the existing residential. Well, I mean, I, why we can't take, why do the plan at all? I mean, you know, Evelyn, you know, this effort's been going on since 2007. You took the other one out for the reason that they the city would not council, be rezoned. The city Why council ask? put money aside to do a plan to preserve and protect the downtown core area and the vital capital investments that they made, to do everything they could to try to help the downtown businesses and those property owners in the downtown area, you know, prosper. So that so that's what this is. It's a planning instrument. It's a planning tool to try to help that that goal and objective. The general you know, to cut you out of the plan. I mean, you're right in the middle of the plan. So to, to cut you out of the plan, it's like I ask myself, why 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 do the plan then? The general plan also. Because Sun Ganji, quite frankly, would like to be cut out of the plan too. They're saying, why do we need to be in the plan? Then why have the plan? Maybe you don't need the plan. Quite the general so. plan also says you're supposed to protect and preserve the existing neighborhoods. Which this plan does. Not, not our neighborhood, it doesn't. Not if it we're does. going to get live work in there. Could you put up that, uh, what the downtown neighborhood kind of reads to? Yes. And that's a description of not those. One, right. uh, let, me, let me go back a minute. Okay, so, so what we end up with is these colors, which talk about districts. Think it's a zone, whatever. Okay, it's a district. And, and each one of those districts has a description, and that's what this is. Downtown core, mixed-use neighborhood, downtown, downtown neighborhood. There's your downtown neighborhood description. Downtown's residential, residential fabric, fabric reg regulations development are designed to preserve and enhance residential character while encouraging new residential development. Now, Evelyn's correct in that in the, require in the district regulations, it talks about permit the, the language that's there now, which we can change. The language that's there now talks about apartments and flats and townhouses and lofts located in upper stories of commercial block buildings as a residential use. So it talks about that. And it all goes on to talk about multiple buildings, talks about live work, talks about row houses, talks about single family detached homes. But, you know, if there are things in this description that are contrary to this this goal and what Evelyn is suggesting, then we can we can redline that out. We can remove that language from this plan. Did you read that again? That description. So, so uh, you know, on page 53 of the redline version under residential, it talks about permitted uses, and it says apartments, flats, townhouses, lofts located in upper stories of commercial block buildings. And then it goes on to s talk about multiple buildings for duplexes, which we have out there, heard about tonight, and triplexes. Talks about live, work, and in integrated type dwelling units. And, and the, the issue there is that if you have an arts and crafts kind of business or a photography studio or something like that, you can have that in your home as a live, work type of dev development. Um, it includes row houses and then, of course, at the end, single family detached homes, which is what Mrs. Halbert has. So in... In, in, in listening to what her concerns are, it's really that first statement regarding apartments and townhouses and that kind of stuff, which, quite frankly, you know, maybe it is in conflict with this. You know, maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a statement, it's a policy that we need to eliminate. Like you said earlier. And that's, again, the purpose of this workshop is to go through this to understand it and allow folks in the audience to raise the question so we can say, yeah, you're right. You know, we need to take another look at that. Like you said earlier, potentially identify some uh, homes that are somewhat historic in the historical class side. And yep. Could we ask the historical society in town to kind of do a an informal list? I think they've already done that. They may have already done that. To the a certain homes that are included on that tour that they take on the yeah. weekend. Yeah. They may they may have something that's of value that we can mm -hmm. that we can use. You know, but again, that's another work program that's that comes as a result of this downtown specific plan. But, but in getting specifically at Ms. Halbert's concern, I mean, the language as presented, which quite frankly I haven't changed. This is the language that's been in the plan since '07. You know, she she um, has concerns with, and that's what you've heard tonight. 
So that language, like you said, we could revisit. Absolutely, any, any of the language in the document you can revisit. You know, you know, between now and when we physically take action on the plan. I mean, now is our chance to roll up our sleeves, so to speak, and to make sure that we understand it, I'm and we understand how it works, and make sure that it accomplishes the goals and objectives that we have. And I'm thinking of some of the historic neighborhoods that I've been through, and actually, I see live, work buildings in those historic neighborhoods. So I would find that, if I were Miss Albert, much less unsatisfactory than the, the townhouses and things. And, and she's referred several times to the live-work units. And I think that those are probably appropriate in, in, in a historic area. You know? You know, again, I mean, that's, that's, that's uh, everyone's got an opinion on it. So, yeah. Anyway. Lots to think about. Yeah. Anyone else? Any more comments? Any more questions? My name is Teresa Catedra, and I live at 3443 Topeka. They're on 5th and Topeka. Um, and so the one plan looks like it's going to exclude us, the red line. But um, a couple of my questions, I'm not sure if it's part of the downtown specific plan, but I see the sidewalks are changing and they're putting in for handicap and that whole area has changed except for our corner. Um, and I'm thinking it's probably because of our retaining wall will cost, I, I'm not sure how that's going to take effect, if that's going to be a part of that. Um, we have the school there and now there's an autistic class so there are more handicap using I'm just wondering how that's going to play in for us. I, I, don't, I don't know if I can respond to that directly. Okay. I know that the city has a very aggressive ADA program. We're going around and correcting all the ADA related issues as quickly as we possibly can, presuming we have the capital infrastructure available. And again, I got to imagine that that intersection is on a list. Yeah, so it's, they, I'm they've thinking we're being it. like avoided if they could. Yeah. It's what I'm thinking because it's going to be challenging yeah. and it would change things for us in our home as well because that retaining wall has been there. We have pictures from the 30s that it was there. So, uh, all, all I can do is I can ask Michael Rydell, our director okay. of public works, and have him, you know, give me a uh, uh, response. If we had your name and, and phone number, we can okay. get back or email a contact, we can get back to okay. you. Okay. And also, when I was looking at a few years ago, looking at the pictures online of the downtown um, Topeka, it looked maybe, and maybe I'm wrong, it seemed as though there was a center. Um, like down Atchison with trees, like a middle of the road. In the past? Um, and, and on some of the Topekas, because the roads were so wide, they were going to... Landscape, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Like a center divider? Yeah. yeah, it looked like a center divide and trees, uh, more aesthetic. And it, I think it was including Topeka at the time, but now would we be discluded from that if we're being taken out of that area? Well, I mean, let me, let me make it clear that, um, you know, before we had RDA funds available to us, now we don't. Well, and a few years ago when I called, first got the first letter, and I'm thinking maybe this may be part of why you don't get as many people in, but when I had called a few years ago, we've lived there like six years, the first time as I started getting letters, that was what I was told is, this is not going to happen in your lifetime. You, there's not enough money, don't even be thinking about it, or, you know, it's not going to be not going to be for you but now we're having you know so we're seeing more letters so we're like okay we maybe this isn't the case but that was what we were told then so there we did disclude ourselves and not participate or be active in that because of that reason you know what you're referring to is there's actually sections in the uh, specific plan and it's shown in streetscape improvements towards the end of the document um, under section 3.4.1 and there's reference to Atchison Street, there's reference to Patterson, and there's reference to neighborhood streets. And the neighborhood street section, um, there's no median. Okay. No median. It's um, sidewalk, landscape planter, parking, and two 10 foot travel lanes. Okay. I, I don't know exactly what the square foot, what the um, total footage is, but most of the right of way in those areas is 100 feet. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and the roads are much wider, and that, and so we do. That is parking. That is the way yep. we came into it. Mm -hmm. um, and with the school there, parking is a challenge because we are sharing. The school has no parking lot. Everybody parks on the street. All of the employees. So, is there any? Are they looking at that at all? I see. I'm. I'm wondering. But now it's being excluded. The school is being excluded. But 
Um, I don't know if you guys are, you know, the school does or not have right. a parking lot for their employees. The school employees park in front of the school and along our street. So if we move our car, they're going to park there, which is fine. We're not complaining or share about sharing that area at all. Just wondering that now, since it's going to be excluded, does that change that at all for the parking for the school? Well, it's we been there a long time and never had it, and, and they we were, functioned. We were, the plan was never really to change or alter the parking patterns that were that are created by the school. Nor were we suggesting to put in a parking lot, you know, to accommodate okay. the school district. I mean, so that's kind of an existing condition. You know, the district's got to deal with that capital improvement on their own. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I was thinking that because of the changing, it looked like the parking was going to change with that aesthetic stuff. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I viewed it wrong. It's, it is what it's it is. still. Yep. Okay. It's the same. No change. Okay. And, and so no money. Right. So for the parking, the sidewalk thing, I can leave my email and. Yeah, that'd be great. Somebody we'll get right check. back okay. to you. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. I, I, I want to, um, Commissioner John Degley was not present tonight, and I wanted to, for John's benefit and for the benefit of those in the audience and certainly for the commission, John uh, submitted to, something to us in writing. So I want to go over those points that, that John uh, presented. Um, says, so, Dear Secretary to the Planning Commission, I'm submitting the following comp comments in, in um, absence to the Secretary of the Planning Commission for consideration and incorporation in the public record for the forthcoming Planning Commission meeting scheduled for August 19th. These comments are in response to particular statements found in the staff report for item 3.1 draft downtown specific plan and are of significant concern to me. Thank you for your consideration. The first policy issue with the downtown specific plan, it says the plan illustrates the construction of an underpass beneath the BNSF main rail line, essentially extending Santa Fe Street as a connection between the downtown core and the cannery property. John's comment, as identified in the draft downtown specific plan, an integral design element for making several components of the downtown specific plan successful including improving connectivity, roadway network level of service, economic growth and viability for the plan area, the downtown area, and the city at large, as well as reducing roadway congestion and travel time, unsafe roadway conditions, greenhouse gas emission levels, and vehicle miles traveled. Further, the underpass element has, an, has had extensive review and scrutiny by citizens, public officials, staff, traffic consultants, and reviewing agencies during many public meetings and remains as a necessary component of the plan viability. I believe the design element should remain as part of the downtown specific plan. Second, he says the plan area bounds boundaries extend, extended easterly to 7th Street where in fact the exception of the properties along Atchison and the East Plan area could stop at 5th or 4th Street. Comment, I think the proposal to move the boundary to 4th or 5th Street will maintain the integrity of, and character of the existing well-established residential neighborhood. I believe the proposed boundary change is of benefit to the local area and the city as a whole. Please note also that there are about 90 units owned and maintained by the Housing Authority of the City of Riverbank that are d have deed restrictions regarding use and are there, therefore not a viable candidate for mixed use development. And I think we all know what he's talking about, which properties that is. Um, so that was one, two, three. Um, the downtown specific plan suggests a pedestrian connection with Zero, Zero Park and Jacob Myers Parks. Comment, I think the proposed revision to eliminate the concept of pathway connection, connecting, excuse me, connecting the downtown specific plan to the parks referenced will result in a more comprehensive and viable plan for the development of the downtown specific plan area by, he's going on, by eliminating a concept that more effectively and more appropriately should be addressed in a specific comprehensive plan program such as pedestrian bicycle master plan. 
So he, he is suggesting to eliminate that connection. And, I, and I've talked about that. It is, it, is, it, is a, it is a complex thing to suggest that you're going to have some type of connection between the downtown area and Zerillo Park that here. Park Not only do you have SR 108, the viaduct, which is an elevated highway, you have the railroad. Rail, railroad. Now we know we have a path here, you know, but we don't, we got a safety issue here. We don't want to, I mean, the railroad, first of all, is not going to let us do anything with any kind of trail next to their railroad, period. So how do I get, how do I make the connection there? I, I honestly don't, don't know. That park serves River Cove neighborhood. It's available citywide, but really services that neighborhood. It is highly likely that when the cannery property develops, that we'll end up with open space and park components as part of that development. You know, a connection, Santa Fe underpass, a pedestrian overpass, some kind of connection would make those open space amenities available to the entire community and certainly to those folks east and west of the BNSF main line. Anyway, so I'll, I'll go on. He has a fourth comment. Light industrial development in the cannery site in the area south of Santa Fe Street between 2nd and 1st Streets. Both the general plan and the downtown specific plan suggest that the existing uses in the plan area would be discontinued in the short term. Representatives of the businesses in that area desire to continue to use these sites to generate jobs and revenue. I think that, that if the use remains active in providing jobs and revenue, these businesses should be permitted to continue indefinitely. And that's really how the plan is written now. You know, whereas before it was kind of discontinued or encouraged to be discontinued, but the reality is if you have viable uses in that downtown core area that are generating jobs and revenue, then we need to encourage that. You know, the ultimate goal and objective is to do something different, but in the interim, absolutely, we need, we need to, you know, promote economic growth and development and promote job creation because that will help support the downtown businesses. So that was the end of John's comments that I wanted to share with everybody. I got a quick comment here, or a question, I should say. In, in the uh, the first draft that was done, yes, um, the boundary is on, it comes straight down. Um, what is that calendar? Yes. The new boundary um, it extends a little further uh, west. Yes. The E I the E I R was done on the past boundary. Yes. So when this now this extension this moving to the east a little here, or excuse me, west. Was the ER taken into consideration with these properties? I'm I'm told the EIR is flexible enough because it's a program level EIR that it will it will it will cover, you know, this is the boundary that was studied. It will cover the boundary that we're suggesting. Okay. The net acreage is is, is smaller. Um, the net number of units in the end of the day is smaller. You know, it's net it's an it's a net decrease in overall scope and scale. Um, the EIR did analyze. You know the underpass. You know they a they analyze it as a vehicular connection. If that get somehow gets reduced to just a pedestrian connection, we're going to have to have our traffic expert take a look at that to as to what impact it has on traffic and circulation. You know I've been told it's not that significant. You know, um, however, however, in 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 talking about this out loud and thinking more and more, I think about it. You know, not only do you have increased train tra train trips or train traffic on the BNS ma BNSF main line, you also have these train trips coming in from Tuolumne County. So, you know, those train trips, you know, those long aggregate train cars paralleling Patterson Road are going to frustrate, you know, traffic, you know, on Patterson Road and traffic, quite frankly, trying to get to the downtown core area. They obviously have 108 in the viaduct. But if they're trying to use Patterson Road, they won't be able to because you'll have these slow-moving cars coming through town at a greater frequency. So, I mean, you know, all that's part of the policy decision I think ultimately we have to make, you know. Is it, is it worth it for us to, you know, invest $8 million in this underpass or do we do something else? Well, they're widening, what is that, 108? SR-108? I mean, the widening is going on right now. On um, in the you're North talking about Clarabel, right? Okay. So we're increasing traffic going that way, which will which will increase traffic. Am I correct? 
Well, um, by widening the road. I mean, I, I think if you talk to Stanislaus County officials, they'll tell you that they're taking care of the existing traffic demand on Clarabelle plus future traffic demand on Clarabelle. Because it's going to go straight through um, Clarabelle and then it crosses over um, Terminal. Okay, now you're talking about Clarabelle Road between Oakdale, Oakdale Road and Claws. We do have railroad, cro but there's there is a there is an at grade railroad crossing on Clarabelle at Terminal. Right. So we have that increased traffic, and then you're going to have increased railway traffic. Yep. So that means there's going to be a bottleneck there. We have in our plans, and the county has in their plans a a grade separation project that has been not been funded yet but it's in it's you know it's it's a project uh, for Clarabelle at terminal which would bring Clarabelle Road up and over that BNSF main line sometime out in the future we're collecting fees for it and the county's got it as a hot sheet for a potential project but there's other <laughs> Other competing issues, you know, like a new getting a signal or something at Roselle and Clarabelle, right? And this thing called North County Corridor, which may or may not, you know, bypass the need for that at grade or that grade separation. And then, of course, Clarabelle Road widening. So there's a lot of lot of, lot of moving parts there. Now, I'm not an engineer, so explain to me wh why would an underpass be more favorable than an overpass? Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I think that would be probably a question for our engineer. Um, I think it has a lot to do with land, land use, land utilization, how much space it requires in order to do it. Um, and, and I guess it's, it would be easier to go do an underpass in this regard than an overpass. The, under, the underpass would serve for the vehicle and, and pedestrian. And pedestrian, correct. Versus just pedestrian. Just a pedestrian overpass, which probably, I mean, just, which probably could be done for a million and a half. I mean, that's what they did for Enox. Up and over Sullivan, it's about a million and a half. So the overpass that you were just talking about, that, that you were discussing, what I brought on Clarabelle. That's for vehicles. Vehicles and pedestrians. Yes. So we're talking about where the underpass. Yes, on Santa Fe. If there was the same type of construction, that's going to be. Fine. Overpass versus an underpass. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what what the engineering. Constraints are one versus the other. I, I can't answer that. The distance between where one is and the other one is not that far. Uh, it's quite a ways. Patterson. No, no, we're talking Santa Fe, right? We're talking Santa Fe all the way to Terminal at Clarabelle? Mm -hmm. That's quite a ways. It's, what, a mile? Is that about a mile? Is the overpass less costly than the underpass? You know, I don't know. Um, I can't answer that question either. I mean, I, th I have to th feel that, you know, they felt from an engineering perspective an underpass was more doable than an overpass. And so they set course on an underpass, which is what we actually have, you know, engineering drawings of, and that w that's which was studied as part of the environmental document for this project. And then I've got cost estimates for that, too, as well. So that was something that was done before I arrived on scene. Okay. So, shall, are we going to continue the workshop, or? Yeah, um, I am having a meeting. We, uh, city manager and I are both having a meeting with Sun Ganji folks on um, Friday to listen to their concerns. They've had the electronic copy of this document, you know, in their possession for almost two months, which is the first time they've ever had it electronically. So they're extremely pleased to get that. Um, they're, they, they've got some concerns, and we're going to listen to them. I think it's appropriate for us to you know, to, c to continue this workshop. I, d I would rather not re-notice again. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, we've done enough yeah, ample done ample notice for that. Um, you know, we're not prepared to take action on it yet. Um, I think there's still room and opportunity to talk with individual business owners and property owners that are affected by it at any time. And, uh, you know, we move forward. So, you know, I would suggest, yeah, let's have another, let's have another, another workshop if you'd like. We can do that in September. And I think, really, I think that before we go much further, we need to decide which of these drawings we're going to focus on because it's really confusing to everybody to keep switching back and forth. Understood. So we 
I think that should be the first. I mean, I, th I think I'm I'm not hearing anything negative about the reduced area boundaries. No. I mean, I, I hear I, mean, I hear an, an individual saying they want all Topeka out, and I'm saying I can't do that. You know, certainly the city council can choose to exclude them, but at this point, for our purposes, I think it needs to be in. So, and I don't. And I mean, it's up to you guys. I mean, you're the commission, but. I think a great, a great extensive amount of research, time, and effort has been put in. I mean, we have the workshop here now, and um, this is an, an opportunity for the community to view their concerns so that, you know, th this is a community effort. This is the city of Riverbank and all its, it, its people within it to make the decision of how this specific plan is going, how this uh, plan is going to be um, generated and constructed. And it looks like we've put enough time into it, and then this is just going to allow us to be able to do whatever little little tweaks we take we can do. But in some areas, whenever you're doing something like this, there are going to have to be some give and takes. And I, I, I think we've uh, done a great job of what we have here right now, and the areas that we're going about um, making sure that we do what's right for Riverbank from here on into the future, is uh, we 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 taking a, a a great leap, and some and a. a a more diverse and direct approach towards it and it's very important that the community shows up and give their input so that we can make the correct changes that we need to make but because we're once again we're looking for the future of Riverbank now everything else is, I mean you, you hear in the news every day about cities or rebuilding or putting uh, new infrastructures in and everything and we have to keep up and this allows us to be able to keep up and keep up in a way and where we don't lose the identity of the city, but we also still gain the attraction of business and income and um, resources that we need in order to keep the city going. So um, I, I think we, you know, we're doing a great job with the with the workshops and we have a good plan here, uh, John. I really okay, think. good, great. So 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 everybody in the audience knows we're not taking any action, and. Right. Um, we're going to continue this to our next meeting as another workshop. Um, I'm going to correct the boundary to what I, what I see now, and I'm going to clean up the document according to what I'm hearing. Um, I can soften the language regarding residential to match that policy language to take care of the objection that really we're hearing. I really would like to, especially in that area, to see if there are any historic homes in there. And then I'll talk, I'll talk with the Historical Society and see if they can give us a list of identified structures that are de uh, designated as, as historic or worthy of being designated for historic. Perfect. Perfect. We can do that. That, that would be great. Thank okay. You. Okay. There's a great question there. There you go. Uh, to the podium, please. <laughs> They want more traffic, more truck traffic. Is that going to be more truck traffic on Patterson or, uh, or Roselle? The, um, or did that get approved? Well, the, the, um, the project he's talking about is the silicon plant. They, we did an architectural site plan review for them. They were building a, a warehouse structure to reduce the number of truck trips between their facility in Roselle and Patterson Road. So that will reduce traffic. And yes, it was approved. They haven't started, they haven't pulled a permit on it yet. They're still going through plan check. But the idea is that would help them reduce the number of trucks, truck trips, between their two facilities. But where are, the, are the trucks going in on Patterson? Yeah. So they're turning in on Patterson. They're turning in on Patterson. But they'll no longer have to go to, from Patterson to Roselle back to Patterson. They, they it's, so it's no, yeah, they're not doubling up on trips, which is a good thing. Missions. Now we're going to open the public hearing. Oh. Ah, sorry. <laughs> so I'm not clear on the. So we are going to say that at this point, then it is the su staff suggested outline, the red line. That is a definite. That's my understanding. Okay, that's what we're. So we're not waiting for a process. Nope. For that to happen, it's just. But still participate. Okay. But that's what we're. Right, going but about. it's that is. Okay. Focus more on that. Thank one. you. Okay, so we're just going to continue this workshop to the next meeting, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And now, if there are no, no more questions or comments, I'm going to open the public hearing. 
And I would like a motion to continue item four point run the rules and procedures for the City of Riverbanks Planning Commission. Oh, I see. Okay, so um, four, four point one is the rules and procedures for the Planning Commission themselves. Um, the last meeting that we had, we there were some concerns about the length of the meetings, and um, so we made adjustments to those. Um, uh, to the, we made adjustments based on what the commission felt was appropriate, um, and those are in your staff report. I think what uh, Chair, Chairperson Stewart is now suggesting is that, that we continue that item because uh, I think it's her belief that she'd like to have more commissioners present before we officially take action on that. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I'd like to uh, make a motion then to move item 4.1 uh, to our next meeting with more commissioners being present. Thank you. And I second it. Chair Stewart? Yes. Commissioner Vilpidua? Yes. And Commissioner McKinney? Yes. Thank you. And now we'll move to item 4.2, general plan consistency of the five-year capital improvement program. Okay, so um, let's see, where are we? Let me get to my... 4.2 here. Sorry, bear with me here a moment. Okay, we, this is a um, this is a, a thing that we do when uh, <clears throat> when the city council takes action on a capital improvement program. We're required to make sure the capital improvement program, which is really your spending of capital dollars on capital improvements, to make sure it's consistent with the general plan. So that that that's what this is. Um, it's a pretty customary uh, matter. Um, in the staff report, it describes <clears throat> specific general plan policies that are related to the capital investments that are made. Um, attachment one is a resolution by this commission um, establishing general, general plan conformance. And attachment two is a physical list of the capital improvements by category, streets, storm drainage, sewer, wastewater, et cetera, with a total capital investment um, suggested. And uh, city council actually has already approved the capital improvement program, so it's so it's kind of defunctory that we're doing this. But the reality is, we need to take action to make sure it's conformance with our general plan. So that's what this is all about. So we need to open a public hearing and see if there's any comments, and you have a draft resolution in front of you. Opening the public hearing. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak in favor of this? Anyone like to speak in opposition? Closing the public hearing. Any comments and questions? I just have a comment. Um, how were these um, these items picked in terms of uh, what went what had priority over the others? Well, I mean, there's a there's a budget committee that that looks at these. Obviously, um, you know, there's a, a, a great effort to try to resolve a number of key deficiency issues that the city has. And certainly we're only spending the dollars, the net net dollars that we have in those accounts. So um, it's a lot of staff time, a lot of staff energy. I guess that's probably the response I need to give to yeah. you that com comes up with this. I think the Citizens Budget Committee is involved in it a little bit, but um, it's quite a bit of work that goes into it. And it's and it's a and it's a evolutionary process, right? Items are added to the list and then deleted from the list depending on where the demands are because that's constantly changing and then that's an issue that um, obviously the city council considers from time to time so yeah you. so we making a motion on the numbers here or you're making a motion on has nothing to do with the numbers has everything to do with the fact that these pro these capital projects that are suggested are consistent with the general plan policies as stated in the resolution that I presented to you 
So does that mean ready to make a motion on yeah, resolution 2014? Yeah, I think so. I um, I guess I'll be correctly do this. Right there, that resolution right there. On top? That, that page up right there on top? No, flip it all the way down. All the way down. No, that page down. It's resolution 2014-011. It's, it's at the tip of your hand on the other hand. The other hand. Down your left hand. Right there. That oh. page. Okay, I make a motion that we go ahead and approve resolution 2014-2011. Dash 011. Dash 011, right? Dash 011. Right. I'll second that motion. Chair Stewart? Commissioner Villapadoua? Yes. And Commissioner McKinney? Yes. Okay. Moving to county referrals and correspondence. Okay. So, um, part of the agreement that we have with Stanislaus County is whenever we have, they have, we have, they have a project in close proximity to us that they send uh, referrals to us as we send to them. And this so happens to be a project in close proximity to the River Heights area. Now, the city will, uh, or excuse me, the, the county will send referrals out to everyone within 300 feet, including all the residents within the River Heights area. But the reality is it's a cell tower. It's close to town. It's in our general plan area. Um, once the cell tower goes up, the reality is that We'll be living with it forever, right? I mean, it, my experience is once the cell tower goes up, you have other things that get added to it, yeah. right? So I felt it was important to bring it to the commission. Initially, the county said that they wanted to have a response back, you know, within two weeks. And I said, hey, look, I really think this is important for my commission to take a look at. The, the, the location of it is, is, is important. You know, it's kind of our western edge into the city. When you take a look at it, it, it will be visible um, from SR-108. Certainly could be visible from the River Heights neighborhood. It's going to be visible from many places around this around town. Um, you know, so anyway, they said fine. So here's our opportunity to take a look at what they presented and maybe ask for something a little bit different. They may say, forget it, we're not going to do it, but at least we can provide comments to them. It's so that's why I'm presenting it. Right? I'm sorry. It's just right outside our sphere of influence. Yeah, if you look at the if you look at the map illustrations that they presented to you, you'll see that um, you will see that it is located north of. We have that's where the uh, that's no. where Oakdale Road ends, right? Yeah. Not well, actually, actually, no, actually, hang on. It's it's south of Stanislaus River, north of Patterson Road, so it's kind of behind Morris Nursery. Kind of behind Morris Nursery, back in there. Is that Croft? Is that a uh, Oakdale Road right here? This Oakdale Road goes east-west. So it's the red. The red area on that map is where the site is. Correct. Right. right. I'm seeing coffee, and it runs parallel with Oakdale, Oakdale. Road. Is all the way over here. That's that one. That's where that one Oakdale runs Road's right into the here. site if it went all the way through. Well, it goes right into River What's Heights. Further? Really, goes right into R River Heights. What's for the? Oh, it's this last yeah. one over here. I was trying to determine exactly where that was. Yeah. This other, the aerial, the aerial actually does a pretty good job. It shows the, actually the site in proximity to the River Heights neighborhood. So if you go to that, you see exactly what's happening. Okay. It's right in their backyard. Yeah. Right? It's right in their backyard. So I saw, I saw this, and I thought to myself, oh, my goodness, I need to make sure that my commission sees this, they're aware of it, they know what's going on. And, you know, so what they propose is a standard cell tower of like, a, um, I think it's 110 feet, did they say in the description? So this what didn't they say? come from them? I like the pictures. This came from Stanislaus County, oh, correct. She's talking about these right here. I like the pictures. Oh, no, wait, hang on. Well, no, I'll go over that in a minute. <laughs> so um, 104 feet. We're talking about 104 feet, uh, three antennas, uh, and ground equipment. So they're going to have a, a shelter, air conditioners, concrete slabs, diesel generator, fuel tank, you know, that kind of stuff on site. But the reality is what you're going to see is a 104-foot structure. Why do you think they didn't put closer to that solar farm, at least? So, so what I did I saw the drawing. Oh. Is, I, is I thought to myself, okay, well, you know, all these other communities are coming up with some pretty creative ways of this dealing with... This is a good one right here. That's what I thought. 
Go, come, just, come up with creative ways. And, you know, we've seen the trees and we've seen, you know, the palm trees. And, and then we've seen, I, I didn't see this one before. There's water, they're doing water towers out of them now. But then I saw this windmill. And I guess they actually did this in Gilroy. I, it just it has country. And I thought to myself, <laughs> that looks pretty cool. It does. Yeah. You can't tell. And it serves two purposes. Yeah. So, okay. So, from what I could tell, the impact that I would be most concerned with is the visual impact associated with something that's that, that tall that's going to be there forever. I so my thought was that if we can suggest an alternative design to its appearance that is more in keeping with the area, that that would be appropriate for us to make a request of. So that's where I, that's where I gave you some suggestions. What is the benefits of this being here? The well, they have a coverage issue. Excuse me. They have a coverage issue. And uh, they have a coverage issue. And uh, because they have a coverage issue, they need to um, they need another cell, cell tower in the area. I mean, they wouldn't go through the expense, right, of, of getting the lease on the property and, and constructing a new facility and all this good stuff unless truly, you know, they had a, a lack of coverage, you know, in an area. And, that, and that's what this is. This is, this is an attempt to clean that up. This is just going to bring more support to Verizon yes. users. Yes, correct. And my experience is, my experience is, once Verizon establishes a tower, you could have other users on the same tower. So, what does the city of Riverbank get out of it, other than you? Yeah. <laughs> we don't get anything out of it. No, no, it's not. We, 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 we are getting the ability by Stanislaus County to comment on a project that's being proposed in Stanislaus County, not in the city of Riverbank, and we appreciate that. Yes. Oh, okay. Then I, I think we should go with something that's more aesthetically appealing. We can at least make the request. Right. Yeah. That's what Here's I'm Here's another thought is solar being so big today. And they're going with a 30 kilowatt diesel generator, 132 <laughs> gallon fuel tank. That That's will, backup. That's yeah, backup, backup fuel. Yeah. That's Which a backup condition. If, if the power <laughs> supply is ever cut for a brownout or any other purposes, they're trying to promote uninterrupted services to their customers, so they're going to do an emergency backup system. Kind of like, kind of like a uh, sewer pump station where we have, or, or a well where you'd have an emergency backup supply system. We have businesses that come in that looking for a, a, good, a better connection with Verizon if that's their chosen uh, wireless or, internet or network services, then the city does have a, a tower in it, I guess, or a tower near it, wherever this thing is. So what, what then I will do is, based on what I'm hearing tonight, I don't need a motion or anything because this is an official action on a project that we're considering, that we're concerned with the aesthetics. So I will send a response to the county. We're concerned with the aesthetics, and we would ask that they consider, right? That's all we can really do. Ask that they consider an alternative design such as this, such as a windmill, which, quite frankly, they may not have thought of. Or maybe they had. I, I guarantee you, the applicant doesn't want to hear that. <laughs> no, it's more, it's exp more expense. It's more expense to them, right? I, I just think it covers up perfect. And then I, I, I have another concern. Although they, they, as they you said, they don't common. have to do anything. But you know, they, they, they can rent their tower, and so you can have like gobs of things hanging all over that. And it, w how, would we really be out of line if we asked them to limit it to no more than? <laughs> A certain number. <laughs> you know, I, that's you know, I, uh, that's kind of tough um, because again, they've got an asset there they're trying to protect, and if they can get more lease for the space, they're going to do that. You know, so I would say probably not. I think we're better off if we can get the appearance to change that's more in keeping with the rural character of the area. I have to agree. So, yeah. and uh, and even if you look at Something this like image, this if you look at this image, there's a lot of things hanging off of it. Yeah. You know, that you really can't, you really can't recognize because you think it looks well, even though it'll be 100 feet in the air. You know, the from a distance, either. from a distance, it's still going to look like, you know, it's still going to look like a windmill, which the is water good. The tower's not that bad either. Yeah. That maybe that's another option. But this isn't Petticoat Junction either, so that's why I thought, you know, windmill was pretty cool. Although this is, yeah, whatever, doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay.
Okay, so I'll, is that okay? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Okay, that's what I'll do then. But, but this equipment shelter, do we have any idea what that's going to look like? Yeah, some brown, ugly... <laughs> Maybe they can make it look like a barn. <laughs> oh, okay. You know, no, I mean, you customize it to the, the outside. It, it you won't see room. it from a distance. Will the, will the people in River Heights be able to see it? Only if they look over their backyard, which they will. You know, they make every I, I, to make a make that suggestion. Okay. No, that's good. I got it. I got it. I got it. No, that's good. I mean, it is Stanislaus County. It is a rural county, right? Yeah. And ag is the number one industry. Yes, it is. So make it look like a barn should be okay. Breaking numbers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You think they would be, be appreciative of that? There you go. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Now, upcoming meeting agenda. Oh, so we'll, more we got, we got, I don't have any, I don't have a current project. We got downtown specific plan. We'll continue to work on that. Yeah, Bringing fun. back the planning procedures. We'll bring, bring that back again. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, so that's it. That's all I've got. Okay. Now, now we are working on the housing element and I'm going to have a housing element workshop. You'll see a notice on that, which is a public workshop on September 30th. It's not a planning commission meeting, it's not a city council meeting, it's a public workshop, just a kickoff regarding the housing element. It's a sleeper, but, you know, that's <laughs> the process we have to go through. Eventually, you will see, you will see the draft housing element, because it has to be presented to you and then off to the city council. So, that's started. Housing element update. Housing element. Required by law. I was going to say that's where we they tell us how many new houses we need. Yep, they've already done that. <laughs> now the fact that we're in the middle of a drought hasn't changed our thinking at all. <laughs> well, we've we've argued, and our mayor has argued as much as we possibly can to reduce those numbers. The problem is the formula that the state sets out is unrealistic for the Central Valley. It's advantageous to the Bay Area. So if you have housing, you're providing housing, you provide more housing. If you don't have housing and you have jobs, you don't have to worry about providing housing. <laughs> so it, the system is what the system is. So there is, you know, talk about changing the legislative rules relative to housing allocations. But currently, it is what it is. So we're doing what we can. And remember, with the housing element, what we're doing is we are um, designating sites, setting policy, but not building. And we're certified. And we're certified. We have a certified housing element, which is wonderful, which means because we have a certified housing element, it's not a cumulative number. So we're not taking last cycle's numbers and adding it to this cycle's numbers. It's just this cycle's numbers. You know, it could, it, so I guess it's a polite way of saying it could be a lot worse. Yeah. It could be a lot worse. There is, <clears throat> and Joan, you probably know more about this than I, there is a policy in the adopted housing element that talks about inclusionary housing. I don't know if you have much history on that, but it, it's suggesting that the city will require affordable housing for any new project. But we never did anything. We were supposed to have adopted a policy or um, an ordinance or something by 2010. Never happened. And I don't know if that's the policy direction the council wants to take right now, to mandate inclusionary housing, affordable housing yeah, because there was on market rate projects. Yeah, there was it's there now. It's part of the adopted policy. Mm -hmm. okay. that's, but <laughs> that's the type of thing that we'll be dealing with is part of the housing element update, you know. I, I, I mean, it's part of the existing policy. Whether we choose to move forward with it or not, we're going to have to report back to the state how we did, you know. Quite frankly, we're going to do some of the things, but, but some of the other things, we're going to tell the state we didn't have enough staff and see what they say, you know. Poor economy, you know, staff cut, staffing cut to the bone, et cetera, which is a true story, accurate story, and it's a story that many of the cities up and down the state of California are going to be stating. But I don't know what the state's response is going to be to that. state may just respond, just respond and say, we don't care. Yeah. They could say that, right? <laughs> yeah. They're just going to say, we don't care. <laughs> you know, so I don't know. We'll see.
I have a question. The meeting that's good, that you're going to have with the um, city manager? Yes, Friday at, two, at 1 o'clock. Okay, so will we get some type of uh, feedback on how that I'll share with you what happened. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you want to... Um, they gave me a four-page letter. I've already had an hour and a half communication with them. And I'm going to be giving them... Uh, I have to give them a written response back. Would you like copies of that? Them is Sun Ganji. Sorry, Sun Ganji folks. Would you like a copy of that? Yeah. Okay. We should. I can share that with you. I can share that with you. So you see what you know what their issues are and what our response was, and then I'll re I'll give you a recap of how that meeting goes on Friday. We're all going to be at the city council meeting next Tuesday. I will be there. An invite. That was a gracious invitation. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I'll be there. Are we adjourned? A meet, meeting is adjourned. Oh, okay, right. good, perfect. Yeah, I see what you're saying.